Hariyom everyone, before we start the actual program, I will just be showing a short video on the Vedanta Wisdom Trust, which has organized this program. Life today poses challenges at various levels. Modern day living is threatened by anxiety, depression, failure at work, climate change and war. But is a life of peace and harmony with fast paced progress possible or even conceivable? The answer, a resounding yes, lies in the ancient Indian philosophy of Vedanta. This pristine knowledge of life and living as found in texts like the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads has answers to all human problems and is a pathway to the ultimate goal of human existence, God or Self-Realization. The Vedanta Wisdom Trust's mission is to educate humanity on this knowledge. Towards this end, it holds weekly online classes attended by learners from all over the world. The Trust's e-learning platform offers a number of self-paced certificate courses. Offline events include outstation retreats, seminars, public lectures and workshops. Top professionals can learn and apply Vedantic knowledge in their fields through the Trust's corporate workshop services. The Trust's upcoming project, the Vedanta Wisdom University, will be the world's first university with a curriculum based on Vedanta. Along with education that provides a means of livelihood, it aims to empower its students to become tomorrow's leaders who can think creatively and advance humankind as a whole. Spearheading the trust and its services is Dr. Janki Santok, a well-known proponent of Vedanta for over three decades now. A sought-after teacher of the subject and an author who writes for The Speaking Tree, The Economic Times and more. Her first book, How Do You Know What You Know, examines thinking and its effects on life. Her new book, The Happiness Guarantee, The Philosophy of Happiness, delves into the foundational principles exposing why our pursuit often leads astray. It uncovers the role of desire and helps master the mind for lasting joy. The Vedanta Wisdom Journal is a platform dedicated to spreading the timeless teachings of Vedanta and exploring their relevance in contemporary times. The journal publishes articles bi-annually. You can subscribe to receive access to these articles and also contribute your own work to be considered for publication. Jankiji's social media presence continues to grow with the YouTube channel Team Janki Santok comprising a subscriber base of thousands across continents. To learn more, please visit Thank you, Mahesh, for uh, playing that video. Aryom, welcome everyone. Good evening to everyone in India. Good morning to everyone who's stateside in the US. Good day to everyone who's in between. Uh, it's a pleasure today to have the session, the Q&A session with uh, Janki Ji on her book, The Happiness Guaranteed. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm delighted to introduce my uh, co-host, co-questioner for this evening, Deepa Nath. Uh, Deepa has been a fellow sadhak on the journey of learning the subject of Vedanta. Uh, today's book title is Happiness Guaranteed. If anyone has spent any time with Deepa, you know, uh, you can be guaranteed happiness in her <laughs> presence. Uh, in her life, uh, outside the Vedartic studies, Deepa is an acclaimed artist. Uh, she has uh, been painting since she was a teenager with a special emphasis on 
painting mother and children. Um, she's also a humanitarian at heart, uh, and she volunteers with an agency, a volunteer agency called ABC, uh, Advocacies for Babies in Crisis. And it's that same passion for babies that reflects in her art. If anyone is traversing through the wonderful Ajit Gandhi International Airport in Hyderabad, where Deepa is based, you will see her paintings actually displayed at the airport. Her paintings are also displayed at Taj Krishna, amongst other places. Deepa has also been a TED speaker herself. Um, she brings her creative side to the conversation today, and we're looking for a lot of creative questions from you, Deepa. Welcome and thank you. Thanks a lot, Deepak. Can I introduce you, Deepak? Uh, yes, yeah, stage is yours, Deepak. Yes. Please. So let me say a few words about Deepak Punwani. Deepak worked on corporate strategy and brand development in China, India, and Singapore for consumer companies. He also co-founded a renewable energy company operating in India and I think other parts of Africa. He also served as a management consultant for corporations across Asia Pacific and Middle East. Currently, co-founder of an education company that works with students from eighth grade till post-grad on academics and career planning. He has been Jankiji student since 2010 and also serves as a trustee of Vedanta Wisdom Trust. Welcome, Deepak and Hari Thank you so much, uh, Deepak, for the kind words. Let's start today's session uh, with Janki Ji, um, talking about her book. Uh, welcome, Janki Ji, to the conversation. Um, Janki Ji actually needs no introduction to her, for her students, her followers on social media, but for those um, for whom they have the privilege for now listening to Janki Ji for the first time, or who missed the video that Mahesh played for us, um, Janki Ji has been a student and a teacher of Vedanta for the past three decades. Her service to the subject takes multiple forms, as we saw in the video. Uh, she's a public speaker. For us, she's a dear teacher who we listen to every week. Um, she writes articles for business journals and uh, for Times of India. She's a corporate resource. Uh, and very recently, uh, Janki Ji is also an acclaimed published author. Her first book was How Do You Know What You Know? And she's just written her second book, Happiness Guaranteed, which is the first part of the book. And uh, thank you so much, Janki Ji. And yes, that's the book that Deepa has. Uh, Janki Ji, um, you know, it's ladies first, so Deepa has allowed me to go first. She's taken her privilege to allow me to ask the first question. Uh, Janki Ji, having read the book and being involved in the earlier phases of the book also, one of the takeaways from the book and also from your classes has been that happiness is our natural state uh, for human beings. Then why is it that happiness is so rare if it's a natural state for all of us? It's a natural state, but unfortunately not a usual state. And the reason it's not a usual state is because we are not capable of simply being ourselves. If we were ourselves, and what is that? Vedanta says you are the self, the omnipotent, the omniscient, the all blissful. Now, which of us is anywhere close to any of this? So since we are not our natural self, we cannot enjoy our natural attributes. We are living a false life. I don't mean we tell lies and things, but I'm not talking about that kind of false life, but false in the sense we are not what we originally are. Or we don't cognize ourselves that way. And so the end result is all the virtues which are ours are not available to us. So if, if you put it in the Vedantic sense, you, you, have, you don't still understand that you are the self and the consequences, you don't have all the attributes of the self. Thank you so much, Janki Ji. Deepa? Yeah. Janki Ji, very early on in the book, you mentioned that once happiness or lack thereof 
is one's own responsibility. So why do so many people, including all of us, ascribe their unhappiness to external factors? Uh, well, our eyes are more powerful than our intellect most of the time. What we see seems more correct than something that we have to think and reach a conclusion about. It's like humans didn't know, right, for centuries that it is not the sun that rises. It, he just didn't know that. Why not? Because their eyes told them. And, you know, the first guy who came about and said, you know, this is not true, the, the people could have responded very naturally. What are you talking? Use your eyes. Like, But unfortunately, our senses do not correctly represent the world always. And we have not developed an intellect enough for us to supersede what our senses are telling us. So what do I see? I see somebody is rude to me and then I see that I'm upset. So my causal relationship becomes he was rude, so I am upset. I do not apply my intellect to say, is it necessary that if he was rude to anybody, that person would be upset? Would Buddha be upset? If Buddha won't be upset by his words, then maybe his words are not the cause of that being upset. Because some people are not upset under that condition. So for that, you have to apply your thinking, your reasoning, your intellect. And only then you can perceive something beyond what seems so apparent and, you know, whatever the sense so of that. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. It uh... takes a long time to get there. Uh, yeah, it depends on how much effort we put in, right? Yeah. For every other thing, if I wanted to run a business, I would not think if I do it occasionally, my business will do well. But it one, when it comes to self-development or spiritual growth, we believe that if I just do it occasionally, whenever I feel like it, whenever the inspiration strikes me and I do it, I will achieve success in it. So the length of time has more to do with our lack of consistent effort. Otherwise, it shouldn't take that long. In the first, in a pretty short time, um, most of life's issues get sorted out. Nankiji, now we are at a stage where we get this knowledge after we get upset. Yes. So, some more time, some more consistency, I guess, on this path. Yeah, <laughs> consistency. And consistency doesn't come because we don't actually recognize the value. We don't have to tell a businessman, be consistent in running your business, right? So why do we have to say it in this? Because that value has not been cognized. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, this is just also uh, one announcement for all those who are listening in today. If you have any questions, um, either having read the book, um, or as we go along in this conversation, please type them on the chat, on the Zoom chat. Uh, Mahesh has left that open and we'll take it up uh, in the last 15 to 20 minutes. So looking forward to all your questions. Janki ji, um, as, as Deepa also mentioned that we have a way to go to achieve happiness. A question actually comes to mind that if someone is dealing with a lot of sorrow today, um, aspires for happiness, some happiness, and then permanent happiness, what is the right relationship they should have with their sorrow before they reach any kind of happiness? Chantiji, since uh, Deepa touched upon my corporate background earlier, you know, one of the quotes that we were told in corporate life is to always invert a problem to get to a solution. And Charlie Munger, who was Warren Buffett's uh, partner, always said, Try to invert a problem and see it from another angle. So in case someone hasn't even got a semblance of happiness, but they are living sorrow, is there a right relationship with sorrow uh, that someone can have? Yes, of course. It's, um, it's a good, good thought to have, good question to have. How do you relate to it? Well, first thing is to realize two important things you have to realize about sorrow. One is, it is a choice that I'm making. And two is, it is impermanent. If we can get these two thoughts about our sorrow perfectly fit in our head, 
it's 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 not that um, it's not um, such a difficult relationship with sorrow. Whenever we go through sorrow, every one of us have been through sorrow. What do you notice about your sorrow? <clears throat> Excuse me. Have you not noticed that it comes and goes? It comes in waves. It's, it, you feel it very intensely at some point, and at some point it seems to not be bothering you so much. So sorrow is not something I've got 24 hours a day with me all the time. It sort of, you know, sort of layers itself. It, it goes in waves. Now, when at, you're at the top of that wave, you know that the bottom of the wave is coming. And when you're at the bottom of the wave, you know that you have so many other options options to, to, to enjoy. Just look out at the sky. It feels so good. See the clouds, see the greenery, whatever music, whatever it is. At the bottom of the wave, you get a choice whether you want to do something a little better for you. And at the top of the wave, you have the choice to remember that though I'm feeling it really intensely and it's really horrible right now, I just have to wait it out. Just wait it out. In the natural course, this thing is going to come down, not, not next year, but in the course of today. So if we have a less difficult relationship with sorrow, we do these two things. Remember, I have a choice, at least at certain parts of the wave, and two, the topmost portion of the wave is not permanent. It comes and goes. Uh, Janki ji, if one may just, uh, just seek a clarification. In the book, you also mention how we process our circumstances in some ways becomes our story. And some people may take a really sorrowful situation and decide to even take their own lives if it gets. And you, and you refer to that. If someone is, is like surrounded by deep, dark sorrow, it, it sometimes becomes very difficult to um, be concerned to the fact that you have a choice or your choice got you into this. And if that's the case, that someone's in, in the grip of, of what may be chronical sorrow, um, what should one do then if if they can't reconcile to the fact that they have a choice to get out of that? Just, just like you said, just wait it out then? Or, uh, no, or... I didn't say, I, what you're saying is what we do as preventive action. That before the sorrow is really bad, we, we sort of understand that our joys, our sorrows are all related to us. We have choices. We make good choices. We make bad choices. Bad choices take us to <coughs> excuse me, bad destinations. Good choices take us to better destinations. Bad choices take us into further and further bad choices. And good choices make us to better and better good choices. All this is preventive action. When you're in sorrow, Okay, you can't go about analyzing. That is why in the Indian tradition, even uh, religious activities are prohibited in what is known as the Ashuddha Kal. Ashuddha, how do you translate? Impure. Impure means you're mentally agitated. So they don't even let you go to the temple. Because all this stuff is to be done as preventive action, not as curative action. So when those that deep sorrow is going on in, in the layers of fate, the choice is at that lowest point, you have the choice to enjoy whatever it is you enjoy. That is the only choice available there. Like if it's music or sport or just looking out the window, having a, a friendly conversation with, I don't know, a neighbor or guard standing down, just asking him, how are you doing today? It's just silly things, you know, which are actually not silly. They're, they, they are they are a large part of the human composition. So we are not talking about choice in the sense of what you did before, because at the moment it's pointless talking about that choice. Mm -hmm. The choice available with me right now when I'm going through that sorrow is at its lowest point I can do something to entertain myself a little bit. I mean, I don't mean some horrible thing to entertain myself, but just normal everyday things to enjoy that meal which you're having. To look at the sky, to enjoy the night sky, the day sky, the clouds, the trees, the, the sound of the birds. 
they did everywhere, you know, it's an amazing thing. That even in our crazy city of Mumbai, I mean, I, you know, you know how crowded Santa Cruz is. But um, there's this little yellow chested bird that comes, yellow breasted bird that comes and sits. I think it's a golden oriole. I don't know which one it is. So pretty. So at the point of sorrow, you'll find stuff which is enjoyable. Enjoy it. That's the choice that you have at that point. There's no point being in sorrow and regretting all the past and making the sorrow worse, right? So you know you have to take better decisions. No doubt you will take them. But at the moment, just let some happiness in. Open the window and let some happiness in. Thank you, Janki. Janki Ji, as someone said about the book, uh, you get insights which are helpful for the next quarter of an hour, the next quarter, and the next quarter century. So this is something that someone who's in sorrow can at least do at the image at once. Uh, Deepa, I'll let you answer ask the next question because I'm sure you have happier questions to ask. No. <laughs> yeah. So Janki Ji, in this book, chapter three, William Bennett's quote makes it seem that we shouldn't quote happiness. I'll wait for Mahesh to put it. Yeah. Makes it seem like we shouldn't quote happiness consciously. Yet we are discussing a personal manifesto for happiness. Something we need to consciously work on every day. How do we reconcile this? Good question, Deepa. It just seems that uh, we seem to be blowing hot and cold on this. Yeah. Let's read William Bennett. Happiness is like a cat. If you try to coax it or call it, it will avoid you. It will never come. But if you pay not attention to it and go about your business, you'll find it rubbing against your legs and jumping mm -hmm. into your lap. It's such a beautiful quote because it tells us everything. It answers your question also, Deepa. So yeah. I'm happy to the quote. Yeah. Happiness is like a cat, meaning don't try to get happiness. That doesn't work. That's what we do. Firstly, 90% of people don't even think about happiness. They are just doing whatever they feel like at that minute. But when you start thinking about it, uh, we start thinking, what shall I do to become happy? Even such as the example that I gave previously, listen to music, play sport, be with family. If you're getting along with your family, whatever it is that gives you happiness, just go grab it with both hands. This is, a, this is not the way you live life. This is a small thing you do when you are going through sorrow. The way you live life has to be a way that gets you happiness. Your way of living life is not to go and get happiness. Your way of living life is having a pure mind and clear intellect by which your actions become more and more unselfish. And when the actions are more and more towards better, nobler, greater things, happiness will just come to you. But when my whole attitude in life is selfish and self-centered, then my happiness will leave. So when I'm selfish and self-centered, I'm going about grabbing things, trying to get myself some happiness. But that's why it you know, we sort of fail at the attempt. And we can all think about this carefully for ourselves. Every time we made a grab, haven't we gotten more agitated? Then we say, okay, chordo. Yeah, chordo, chordo. What chordo? You can't chordo like that. You have to take up something higher. And when you take up something higher, nobler, better, you're, you're distracted from all this grabbing that that seems so instinctive to do. So when you uh, work like this with a pure mind and a sharp intellect, pure mind because then your intention is to help, to serve. Mm -hmm. And sharp intellect means you're taking the right actions for that purpose, not stupid actions for that purpose. Mm -hmm. You can't go about helping in such a way that that person is destroyed and we are also destroyed, both get destroyed. Yeah. You are thinking about how you are going to do this. So with a pure mind and a sharp intellect, 
which translates into good normal actions. If you concentrate on your business, as he calls it, what's our business in life? To do these good actions, then happiness comes to us. But when you go and chase it directly, that's when the trouble starts. So it's unselfish, it's unselfish actions towards the nobler goals. Yeah. On a day-to-day -day basis, how do we decide, Janki Ji, which is nobler? Whatever takes you to your goal. First, you have to have yeah. that goal, right? Like, let's yeah. say you're yeah. an artist. So whatever you do, you can do um, with, uh, with the intent, like name, fame, reputation, whatever. Income, so many other issues can come. But if you do the art for the sake of the art, for the, for the cause of the art, or any other thing, I mean, I'm just giving a right yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, for creating a beautiful piece of art that I can connect to. Yes, or yeah. some, making something pretty for somebody's yeah, house, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Then, then all the other things go out of focus. Yeah. Like a woman is cooking at home or a man is cooking at home. So if he if he looks upon it as oh my god, I have to cook. Then it's a chore. But if he's looking after the health of his family, then suddenly he's inspired to do the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So beautifully you explained, even at the level of cooking. Thank you so much. Very clear. Uh, Janki ji, yeah. on that on that happier note, um, is a goal something that we need to revisit uh, every once in a while? Uh, you have this passage in the book where you talk about the percentage of happiness, how we may be at 60 and then suddenly if we go down and then come back up, that delta becomes our happiness. So should we be checking, and you mentioned like a regular health checkup is needed. Should we be checking our levels of happiness um, on a daily basis for a personal manifesto or on a periodic basis? And by extension, should we be checking our goals? Yes, not our happiness as much as our goals and our actions. Because happiness is always a byproduct. So you do check your happiness, but not on a daily basis. You, you check both the happiness and the goal on a, on maybe six months, one year basis. Because if you do it anymore, you become result oriented. And if you do it too little, you make it mechanical. So if you get result oriented, then you simply chase your happiness away again because, oh my God, I'm like this, I've not got that. And you know, just hassle ourselves unnecessarily. And if you get mechanical, that's even worse. Because uh, sometimes um, you are a very good person who is stagnating. And that's really the worst case scenario. Because here you are a very, very happy person. You're doing good work and you're stuck. So you have to elevate that goal further. Uh, the whole point of Vedanta is that we should reach self-realization. We should reach the ultimate. And most of us always think in terms of bad people becoming good. But this is not about that. This is about good people getting better and better and better till they realize. But when a good person stops his journey, that's really sad. It's like a good student in class has um, come first up to 7th standard, 8th standard, and after that gives up his education because he thinks he knows everything. So that's the most tragic of them all, that when the good people do not pursue further. So what do we check? We check our goals and, and by default, therefore, our happiness every six months to a year or whatever it is a long enough time frame you can handle. Uh, but on a daily basis, we check for our unselfishness. Like, how have I been unselfish today? What have I done? What service have I done? There are different levels of unselfishness. One is when I cooperate with you. So have I cooperated with you? That way both of us, you know, sort of are gaining something together. 
It's not me at your cost, but both of us together. Then when you grow from that, you become altruistic. Altruistic means I will give to you. I'm not, I'm not, it's, I don't intend to gain out of that giving. Then you grow to become self-sacrificial. That I will even sacrifice my interest for you. So the very, very different levels. And through the course of the day, you can have many, many levels. But the question is, have I at least cooperated today? Minimum level. Forget unself, forget altruism and forget um, self-sacrifice. So have I at least cooperated with everybody that I have met today? So that's what you check on a daily basis, that you are being unselfish in some way or the other. And goals and happiness, six months, one year. Thank you, Jankuji. Jankuji, I have a doubt. There's a common belief among economists who lightheartedly say that if everyone finds happiness within themselves, it will lead to a decline in conspicuous consumption and world will go into recession. So would applying the concepts from your book lead to economic collapse of the world? Very good questions you both are coming up with. <laughs> uh, the, the, the economists have not studied the concept of tamas rajasan sattva. Mm -hmm. So tamas is a state where you don't work. Rajas is a state where you work because you're so agitated. Sattva is the state where you're completely at peace and your work is at your highest capability and potential. So what we are trying to do is reach the sattvic stage mm -hmm. where we don't work because we're agitated. We work out of the joy of our hearts. We work because we have noble causes to achieve, not because of something bothering me. You're right. There are many people who don't work. I mean, you know, nowadays it's become... It's become like a very common thing to say, I'm reducing work, I am retiring, I'm looking forward to not doing anything. All and all the all the WhatsApp forwards and LinkedIn posts will say things like, Oh, your work is not important, your family is important, um, you know, your work is not important, your health is important. All this stuff is going on in society. And because of this wrong messaging that is going out all the time, we are very likely to go into the situation the economists are talking about. Because mm -hmm. now what is the condition? If I've got enough money, I don't want it. That is the way. That means yeah. that all my work was only for the money. Now I have the money. Why should I work? But that's a, there's a fundamental error there. The work is not for the money. The work is for the noble cause. Now, having money is a great thing. And if you've got it, super. Please get more. Give it to us also. There's no harm with money. The problem is, the work is not primarily for the money. So, the economists are right because they are seeing that rajas, rajas turning to tamas nowadays. And it's a terrible thing. That, okay, I have enough money, I don't need to work. If you have enough money, then please work for others because they need the money. There's so much you could do. So, uh, in fact, if you don't work, it's a miserable, miserable life. You pull yourself down into um, old age and, and negativity because you're pulling yourself into tamas. The Upanishad says, may you live a hundred years working. So economists are right, but that's because they are, they and almost everybody else talks about this transition from tamas to rajas. And then once you have enough, come back to tamas. So we are talking about a completely different thing. But sattva, where you work, you work at your very hardest, being completely peaceful and with no selfish end to achieve. Total joy. You love the work. I mean, yeah. the work is what is. And by work, I don't mean you have to go and do any particular work. Yeah. Whatever you're doing, yeah. you're doing it unselfishly, nobly. So it's going to be causing tremendous joy. 
Thank you so much for that. Yankee ji, there is a mention in, in this conversation also, and you've talked about it in the book, about how desires lead to unhappiness, agitations and unhappiness. And then there is a way to get permanent happiness, which is reduction and then elimination of desire. So that seems the one way to reach uh, that goal. So it seems to find permanent happiness, there is one way. Why are there so many ways to find unhappiness? If there's one way to happiness, there should ideally be one way to unhappiness. Why are there billions of ways in which we can be unhappy? There's one truth and there can be billions of falsehoods. Falsehood, you can create any amount. It is the one truth which is like you got it, then you got it now. So why are there ways? Because misunderstandings can be a billion. There is a rope. There is a rope. You see it as a rope, life is very simple. But if you don't see it as a rope, you can have a billion misunderstandings. You can see it as a snake. You can see it as a crack in the ground. You can see it as a twig. You, you can see it as nothing. Any amount of nonsense we, we are capable of creating and we do create. Why is it so? You can ask me. But that's the law. The truth is one, the falsehood of so many. Thank you. Janki ji, what's the one big takeaway that you would want all readers to take from this book? If there is one single concept you want to leave them with, which one would it be? Well, I would love people to understand that this is something to think about and something to apply oneself to and not go through life so mechanically thinking that if I just manage to tick all the boxes, mm -hmm. I'm going to find happiness. And we have a very, very small basket of boxes to tick. We have to get the education, we have to get the family, we have to get the job, we have to get the money, we have to get the health. That's it. That's about more or less the, and maybe throw in a couple of extracurricular activities like sports or other hobbies or, you know, that's it. That's my life. No, it's not. Bit of social work. Yeah, I saw many, yeah. anything, yeah. any extracurricular yeah. they love to throw in. But as a human being, we have, we have access to more. Why are we denying it to ourselves? So what is the takeaway? Let's think about this thing. It's an important thing for us to think of. I mean, I know it's not a very practical takeaway in certain way. What to do? What to do? We have to wait for volume three. That is listed out what we can do. But volume one should be like, this is something we need to think about and design our lives according to however we have thought. It's not just think in the air, but then design yeah. life accordingly. Bit of a task, but yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we've had a lot of questions come yeah. through in the last yeah. half an hour or so. So, um, you know, I know, I know, Deepa, you're the artist, but I can I take the creative liberty to have the last question for Janki Ji from our side? Yes, of take... course, of course. Okay, so I'll take my creative license. <laughs> um, Janki Ji, there's a reference in chapter six of the book which talks about comfort and purpose as the two um, ends of happiness spectrum. Uh, I think Mahesh has graciously put that up. Um, it says that having both ends of the spectrum, comfort and purpose is important for human life and fulfillment. Comfort is important. It implies that various aspects of Swadharma are well catered to. Without this overall care of the personality, there will be dissatisfaction. But if this aspect alone is taken care of, there is no sense of fulfillment. Thus, many successful people feel a void. That leads others to say success is futile. It is not. It is just not the complete picture. Would it be fair for someone to therefore understand that comfort comes before purpose? That it's a precondition to finding purpose and therefore finding the full spectrum of happiness. And if that is the case, 
Then for someone who's not found their swadharma, are they predestined to always be unhappy and never find true happiness? Uh, to the second question, yes. If you don't know your swadharma, you're not going to be happy, no matter what else you do. But is it that you have to find comfort before fulfillment? We can't ever make that statement because at what level with the, will a human being claim to be comfortable? He can always ask for more. He can always feel that it's not enough. And that feeling of it's not enough will continue until he gets more fulfillment. Then why are we saying this thing about comfort? Because what happens sometimes is that we become very serious about life. And we have so many things to do that we forget like, like basic things. Eat on time, sleep properly, drink enough water. You know, we, we are all very serious and this is to be done and that is to be done. It's just like be comfortable. Or somebody gets involved in, 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 in I don't know, suppose you get some horrible, horrible mother-in-law, you know, like really somebody from outer hell or something, then you have to realize this is not something I can really deal with. So I might need to create some space. Uh, I'm not recommending that joint families split up. I, I'm very pro joint families. But there are certain conditions under which people can be extremely difficult, extremely beyond what is normal. I don't know how you would define that, but but it's just too much. So in which case, you please be comfortable in that case. If you just can't handle it, then be com comfortable. So it's not one or the other. It's not one before the other. It's like both these things have to go on simultaneously. This comfort part is maybe 5-10% of life, but you can't afford to ignore it. Otherwise, there will always be that nagging frustration. If one just simply go away. Okay, if you so you only fulfillment and no comfort, then there'll be that nagging frustration. You do comfort and no fulfillment, then you feel like the hollowness of everything, which so many people have reported. And if you do comfort before fulfillment, then there is no end to this. So comfort and fulfillment have to go together at all times. I mean, you have to take care of the personality, right? It's almost like if you take it to some other thing, it's easier to understand. The vehicle, let's take a car. Keeping the car comfortable and keeping it moving towards the destination are always happening simultaneously. You can't get the car all heated up and then hope that it will take you to the destination. That doesn't work. You have to treat it properly as well as take it to the destination. Um, Deepa, with your permission, can we take some um, yeah, there audience much, questions? A lot um, of live questions, yeah. Yeah, there are quite a live questions. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, there, there, there are two questions that are very similar. So if you allow me, I, I'll uh, yeah, jump yeah, in please. with those and then you can pick a question. Um, uh, Janki ji, Momita has asked a question and then Deepak Jethi has asked a question. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm, I'll try to sort of get the spirit of both their questions into one. Um, Mamita is asking, is it right effort to choose to act in a kind and conciliatory manner, although we feel angry? And then in brackets, she says, and we feel like the situation would be bettered by an appeasing behavior, and therefore you're choosing appeasing behavior instead of feeling angry. Or is that inauthentic? That's what she asks. And then Deepak Jethi asks that my happiness is affected, is affected through interaction with negative slash aggressive people. He's asking if that is correct. For happiness, should we manage relationship with negative people or should we end it? So uh, Deepak is asking about his relationship with negative people. Momita is asking what should be her reaction when she is dealing with someone who's a little negative? Should she act angry if she's feeling angry? Or should she be more appeasing? Um, so it's sort of related. 
So mommy thought, I'll take that first. Mommy thought, should we have this abusing behavior to think the situation is going to get worse if, if you exhibit your anger? It's all a matter of what are you trying to achieve? When you think in terms of what am I trying to achieve, what you should be doing becomes easier to understand. Appeasing behavior, the term appeasing doesn't sound good. I don't know what exactly you mean by it, but it doesn't come across as something anyone should do. You should cooperate. You should be um, understanding, you should be sensitive. But this appeasing behavior, the, I know you're good at English, so I'm questioning the word appeasing. doesn't sound like you think it's the right thing to do because you use that word. And as opposed to any other nicer word which you are more than capable of using. So um, you have to see whether you are achieving the desired result. Let us say somebody is being very ag aggressive towards you and you are doing what you call appeasing behavior. So has that aggression towards you decreased? Have you become more comfortable? Has the other person become more comfortable? What has been the consequence of it? So if your consequences are not in line with what you wanted, then this action was not right. So, so the, the question to ask myself is, uh, what am I trying to achieve? And is this behavior achieving this? Okay, so if you say I'm trying to achieve peace in the relationship, and what is happening is that you're becoming more and more frustrated, then you're not achieving peace in the relationship. Because you're frustrated and relationship means two people. So you work with that thought. And Deepak JT, do you have to put up with aggressive and negative people? No, why would you? For what need is there to put up with aggressive and negative people? Unless there is a need. In which case you will have to find out what is that particular need? Is it helping you reach your goal, whatever it is? Is your goal sensible goal to be reached? And uh, whether you have the capacity to deal with these people. Should I fight with Muhammad Ali or not? If you ask me, I'll say, well, I, mean, I don't know your strengths. So please fight or don't fight based on your own capability. But, but per se, do I have to deal with all the aggressive and negative people? Not at all. There should be some good reason to deal with them. There should be a capacity to deal with them. And there should be some point, right? So there should be some point of dealing with it. Must take you to a nobler or higher goal. Should I get Ajay Chaudhary's question, Deepa? Yes, please. Yeah. This question from Mr. Ajay Chaudhary. Many pranam. Ultimately, our happiness depends upon how much we can make our mind strong and take everything in an attached way. But it's not easy to strengthen the mind when the vasanas are so strong. How can we deal with this problem to purify our mind? We want to do good work, but the mind resists. We want to do bhakti here too, and the mind takes us to the world and not allow us to love God. What to do? <laughs> We have to begin at the level of action always. The intellect has to, and you're saying attached, I'm assuming you meant to do yeah. that. Unattached way. Unattached. Take everything in an unattached way. So these are all consequences. They are not causes. Causes are actions. Noble actions, good actions, or unselfish actions. When, when we do this, the mind becomes purer and stops reacting to us, to our saying things so much. That's one. Second thing is, let's not run before we can crawl. Let's not try too hard to attain too high a thing. Let's go on the daily basis. Like a small thing. Every day, small, small things will let us attend to. You see what? I've got an email. Let me respond to it. You know, small, small things. Um, I have to go to do my exercises daily. So let me try and do that. This everyday small exertion of the intellect to do the right thing moment by moment by moment. Those are the things that is my practice. It's my wall practice for when some bigger problem comes. Let's not 
handle big problems straight away. Let's start with the small, everyday, daily ones, which we can do so little by little. So if you say, I must stay unattached under all circumstances, <laughs> sounds too much. So let's just on a daily basis do right actions, right thinking. I am, I'm, I'm since you're saying all this, I'm assuming you're doing your morning studies and uh, morning studies and moment after moment, just doing the right thing. You will find that most of us have no idea how to do the right thing. We determine what we want to do and then we find all the reasons to do that thing. It's so tough. And how do you know? Let somebody oppose your the action. Let somebody say, oh, why don't you try this or do that? And you'll immediately defend your action because it's that action you want to do. The reasons are not important. It was that liking for the action. So very carefully we have to, you know, sort of mold the mind to do the right thing moment after moment. Thank you, Janki Ji. Uh, I hope that answered you, Ajay. Yadipa, please take the next one. Thank you. Uh, Janki Ji, I'm going to combine two questions again. Uh, one is seeming more on a micro level, on an individual level. One is seeming more on a macro level, on the world level. Uh, Suganda asks, how to deal with deep, dark sorrow? And she has dark sorrow in capitals. Uh, after death, and in brackets, she asks, without saying goodbye. So if you had death of someone, I would have the opportunity to say goodbye. Disease, heartbreak, or an opportunity lost forever. So how does one deal with this sorrow? And then um, uh, somewhere down in the question, Shrikar asks, how to reconcile to be happy given terrible events happening across the world? Should we turn a blind eye to world events? So both are asking about sorrow. One is asking about sorrow related to deep personal events. One is asking about terrible things happening across the world. Those are asking questions. Be nice if you switch your video on so then I have somebody to talk to who is actually asking the question. So um, who was the first person you said? Suganda. So Suganda, if you could turn your video on uh, and at the same time, uh, Shrikar, maybe if you could also turn your video on. Suganda asked the question about a deep sorrow related to a personal event and Shrikar is asking about world events. Okay, Suganda. Um, so Suganda, I'm going to all... I mean, there's so many factors involved. What is the distance from that sorrow? Sometimes something terrible has happened and immediately we want the sorrow to go away at want, right? Give it time. Uh, Mahesh, you okay. your audio on. Um, um, so give it, I mean, depending on how much time something has... Um, you know, firstly, if, if like some horrible thing has happened yesterday, don't expect to not be unhappy today. Unhappiness is a natural phenomenon for us. It's not a horrible thing that we have to run away and the moment you feel the least bit of un unhappiness, you do something about it. No, it's a natural phenomenon. Just go through it. It, it There's no um, like horrible, horrible thing happening. It, it's fine. Everyone will go through sorrow. It's part of the human condition. If you don't feel sorrow, there's something wrong with you. But if you have been feeling sorrow over the same thing for the last 25 years, then there is something wrong. Because the way nature has programmed us is that when this negative thing happens, you will feel terrible sorrow. And if you let that emotion just be, then that sorrow will, in the natural course of events, come down. That's why, you know, the common saying, time heals. Now, if it hasn't healed, then some intervention will become necessary. What kind of intervention will become necessary is dependent on how that sorrow is. Uh, it could be attending Vedanta classes. So that should reduce the sorrow a bit. But if it has not gone, then maybe counseling uh, professional counseling, even then it doesn't go, then maybe it requires actual medication. So depending on the situation, you can do 
uh, various things, but your question is is not precise, so an answer cannot be given as to what exactly is to be done in that situation. It depends on so many factors. But what we can do and what we must do is work towards the prevention of excessive sorrow, which we do by learning the whole thing about happiness and living our life in the right way. And that's a much better way to look at it rather than this deep, dark sorrow. Now, what do I do? Now, it depends on what is a deep, dark sorrow. It, it, it's a, you know, call it deep, dark sorrow. How does one handle it, you know, in an online program with no details? The, the nature of the question and the, uh, what should I say, platform to deal with it are not aligned. Ranki ji, Suganda just sent a message also. She says she couldn't come on the video because she's driving currently. Yes, yes, I saw that. And that's why I said thank you, Suganda. Um, now, the second part was Shridhar, Shrikar. Shrikar, you're saying there's so much sorrow in the world. How can we be happy? Yes, that's so true. It becomes difficult. However, as our sorrow starts deriving from nobler and nobler values, that sorrow agitates us less. So the agitation of incredibly selfish sorrow is tremendous. Like Duryodhana, you know, or like, like a carnivorous animal. It's terrible. But as, as the sorrow is deeper, it's for bigger and nobler things, the agitations thereof reduce. So how are we happy? We can't call it happy, but we're not so agitated. Right? Can use the word happy and how do we deal with it by doing what we can it's all very easy for us to sit at home and say i'm so unhappy about x and y and z but the question is what am i doing about it so once i start converting that sorrow to an actual action this is what i can do about it um i use my sorrow productively like, for instance, if I feel terrible that there's a war going on, two wars going on, other nations are getting involved. And, you know, poor babies are suffering because of it. So what can I do? Is there anything I can do? And if there is, then what? Now, um, we have, we are all, I'm sure everybody in this classroom feels uh, the sorrow of of all the tragedies that go on around us. But then what are we doing? We came up with one answer. We said if we set up the Vedanta University, then we will do a lot of work in the prevention of sorrow for most people. Because you'll create a calm mind, a pure mind, and a strong intellect. And such people will prevent sorrow both for, in their own lives as well as other people's lives. So we came up with an answer for that. Now you have to come up with your own answer or align with somebody whose answer you agree with. But that's the way we use our sorrow productively instead of sinking down into it. Is that okay? Yeah. Deepa, maybe you choose one last question for Janki Ji to answer. We're just reaching the end of the How one many hour. more here? Just wondering. Yeah, I'm going to take this question on meditation. Subrata Chaudhary, he says, is meditation will help for reduction of desire and thereby increase in happiness. I think what he means is, will meditation help in reduction of desires and thereby does it increase in happiness? I don't know if it's a question or a statement, but you can answer the Shanti Ji. Okay, we'll assume it's a question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes and no. It will help in the reduction of agitations if the only desire you have is self-realization. But if you have desires other than self-realization, it will not help. Because the purpose of meditation is to remove the last desire, which is the desire for self-realization. But the condition we all are in today is we are still creating that desire. And why are we creating that desire? Because we want to get rid of the other desires. 
So to help us get rid of the other desires, we create the desire for self-realization. And then when we have only that desire left, we meditate to remove that desire. Now, if this is not my condition, then meditation is pointless for me. So meditation is very helpful under that condition, but not helpful under other conditions. I mean, it's pointless. What are we doing it for? And also depends on what you mean by meditation. Some people think of Shavasana as meditation. Some people think of sitting quietly as meditation. I'm not talking about meditation like that. I'm talking about the real meditation where you're focusing single-pointedly on a single thought. So that will be effective only at the last stage. If you want to sit quietly for some time, that's fine. But don't force the mind to focus on one thought. So are we ending here, Deepak? Yes. Uh, the time is up. Yeah. There are some questions. There are a few other questions. But I'm sure if you have a way, Deepa, to tell them how to attend classes and yeah. have their questions answered. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank our very beloved teacher, Janki Ji, for her wisdom on the topic of happiness. For those who want to continue studies on this subject, there's a new class starting from next Friday. I think Mahesh is giving us the details. There's a WhatsApp number also. And those who want to be connected with the subject, please join our WhatsApp group by sending a message. There's a number given there that ends with 62851. Also, let me thank volunteers behind the camera who made this event possible, especially Bharat as a coordinator this session and Mahesh for all the IT and the marketing. If any of your questions are unanswered, please join us. I'm sure Janki ji will discuss at length and give you the answer that you're looking for. Thank you, Janki ji. Thank you, Deepak. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you, whole team. Yeah. And for all those who want to, who I'm, I'm just seeing the questions right now. Yeah. So many which we were not able to take, but we will take it in the class. So if you come to the class, we will take them there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.